Tonight on Oregon Field Guide. Oregon built a bridge for wildlife to save lives. We'll check in to see how it's working. They're calling for rain with a low around 47. Then we take you behind the scenes of one of our most dangerous stories ever. Wow. It's fraught with hazards. If there's any way to get out of here right now, we'd be going. We headed into the depths of the crater on Mount St. Helens in search of a system of glacial caves. Then we head to Bandon to watch resident Denny Dyke draw his massive, elaborate sand labyrinths. The fall months of October and November are peak season for deer to be migrating. The Oregon State Police say they're also the top months for car crashes involving animals. A couple of years ago, the Department of Transportation built a bridge just for wildlife. Vince Patton takes us to Central Oregon to see how the state's very first large-scale wildlife passage structure is working. It's not always easy going home. When deer need to get there, they often must conquer an obstacle course of fences and roads. They don't stay in one area particularly. They need to get to their summer range or their winter range to forage and have enough storage to get through winter. Miles upon miles of human-made barriers snake across even the most wide open landscape. Fences can pose a serious hurdle, especially for shorter animals who can't clear them in a nimble hop. And then there are the deadliest obstacles, confronting a dangerous virtual wall of flying metal. As the traffic level increases, the deer are less able to cross the highway until it gets to a point where, from studies, the deer just won't cross at all anymore. You have stranded herds of animals. Every year in Oregon, hundreds of vehicles hit wild animals. The collisions can cause severe injuries or deaths to the passengers, and the animals seldom ever survive. In particular, Highway 97 has had a serious problem with wildlife collisions. This was identified as a collision hotspot. To combat that, the Oregon Department of Transportation built an underpass just for the animals, south of Bend, near Sun River. Kevin Halesworth is a biologist for ODOT. He says now you can drive right over wildlife all day long. Most people probably don't even know it's there. They would just drive straight over the top of it and not even see it. Oregon is imitating Canada. In one of the most spectacular places in North America, Banff is known not just for its wildness. It's also riddled with bridges. 44 of them have been built exclusively for wildlife. They've been a tremendous success. In 15 years, Parks Canada estimates that deer, moose, bear, cougars, elk, and more have made 150,000 safe crossings. In Oregon, ODOT built an underpass just for wildlife. Kevin Halesworth wondered how long they'd have to wait to see results. Turns out, ODOT had its answer instantly. As soon as it was constructed, there was deer going under it. So far, we've had great success with this wildlife crossing. We've had a lot less collisions. We've had huge increase in use. We have a large number of mule deer moving from summer to winter range during migration periods. In addition, crews installed four miles of tall fences along both sides of the highway. Animals that encounter that fence search for an opening to get through. There isn't any until they reach the underpass. Still, some animals wander up the road itself on the wrong side of the fence. For them, ODOT has built one-way emergency exit ramps, highly camouflaged to the human eye. They run up from the road and over the fence back into the forest. They call them jump outs. They call them in Canada and Europe escape ramps. Jump outs slope up, then stop like a cliff. They're not too tall for the average deer to hop down to safety. But when approached from the woods, they're certainly too tall to jump up into the road area. Still, ODOT is tweaking their design. And work in progress and we keep making them better and better and then we learn something else just when you think you've got it dialed in, then you learn again. There are so many electric eyes watching the crossings, the NSA would be proud. 
think I have 26 cameras throughout the project and I check them once every two weeks. It's been John Nelson's job to retrieve the photos and keep the camera batteries going. Every single motion triggers a picture. That leaves John thousands of day and night photos to sift through. The numbers of deer using these projects just skyrocketed. This area in particular, this crossing, this looked like a deer highway. I mean, it was solid footprints all through here, and we would get hundreds if not thousands of pictures on each of the cameras of migrating mule deer coming through this structure. We get weasels quite often, badgers, a lot of coyote activity, and we also had a bobcat that not only was using this structure to cross the highway, but he was actually actively hunting in here, and we have pictures of him capturing prey. We had a coyote carrying what we think is a cat in its mouth in the last run of pictures. This crossing is about far more than simply trying to prevent damage to cars. Deer need the help. It appears that the mule deer populations are declining in the western states. The numbers have estimated around 200,000 in this state right now, and they were a lot higher than that less than 20 years ago, maybe almost double actually. Of course, the question for the ages is, why do deer cross the road? The answer, because the roads we've built stand as barriers between them and their seasonal food and shelter. In Oregon, the animals are migratory. So typically, the mule deer, they summer up high and they winter down low. Mule deer live mostly on the east side of the Cascades. Nick says they don't adapt to people as well as the black-tailed and white-tailed deer farther west. Mule deer are a little different. The species as a whole really re relies on intact habitat and undeveloped country where they have room to roam, essentially. Here you go, JJ. Nick Dobrich is with the Oregon Natural Desert Association. I got right on him. So today we're out on a volunteer trip and we're counting mule deer. He helps to lead a survey of mule deer at the Hart Mountain Refuge in far southeastern Oregon. We need these counts for mule deer, basically a good, good understanding of how many animals are out here. But across the state, information is pretty sparse about where mule deer go and how long they stay. We kind of have a good sense of where they winter, as well as where the animals summer. We don't have a sense of where exactly they travel for the most part. He's all in favor of helping deer get where they need to go. Let's be proactive and make sure we're reducing barriers to their migration corridors, because otherwise you're basically just separating the animals from their historic range. In central Oregon, the pumice fields at Lava Butte naturally restrict herds from moving from the mountains to the flatlands. Adding the fencing there worked well to direct animals towards the underpasses. Two days a week, we drive the highway very slowly, and I'm looking for any evidence that an animal has been struck by a car. But just as he passes the end of the fence, John spots something. Oh, there's a dead coyote. The coyote on the shoulder lies south of the protected zone. If he'd tried to cross the highway just half a mile north, the fence would have directed him safely to the underpass. We don't get roadkill coyotes too often. This animal can't have been here maybe, maybe a day or two. If it is real close to the highway, I'll drag it off. ODOT and the area vultures are not the only ones noticing less roadkill. The Sun River Nature Center does too. They have raptors to feed and have permission to collect dead animals for their meat. We either go pick it up ourselves and we will, uh, on site we can actually cut it up, take what we need and let the rest back to nature. Naturalist Cody Osborne says he's got to travel much farther to find meat for the birds because the overpass works so well keeping animals alive. I don't think I've seen a carcass in that section in a couple of years. The wildlife crossing works well for many animals, but some don't like going under things. This is for mule deer primarily. ODOT has a design in mind for a second crossing. This time, it'll be a bridge, disguised as naturally as possible, over the cars. The overcrossing will be designed primarily with elk in mind. Elk need a larger line of sight. We're hoping to have it go over the highway. 50 years time, maybe we'll have dozens of crossings. We, we don't know. As human populations inevitably increase, it will add yet more pressure on wildlife and their homes. Oregon's first experiment shows that if you build links between animals and their land, they will use them. 
We have had black bear, we're hoping to see cougar and potentially a wolf in the near future. Every animal that uses the crossing is a potential collision avoided as far as I'm concerned. And that's a good thing for humans and animals alike. ODOT says this first wildlife underpass costs one and a half million dollars. A cost it says will be saved in 12 years in the number of crashes that don't happen. Last year, we featured a story on a new discovery on Mount St. Helens. It turned out to be one of the most dangerous adventures in our 26 year history. A number of folks have asked us just how we did it, so we thought we'd share this behind the scenes look at everything that went into that production. Someday in the future, we're gonna tell a great story about this. Oh, wow. They're calling for rain with a low around 47. We think the gusts have been about uh, 40 miles an hour. It's fraught with hazards. There's caving, mountaineering, glaciology, and volcanology all kind of woven into one mess. If there's any way to get out of here right now, we'd be going. We don't even know how to get out of here. We got flown in, we don't even know how to climb out if we wanted to. My name is Ed Yon. I've been a producer with Oregon Field Guide for almost 15 years now. In a previous season, we'd done an expedition to the glacier caves of Mount Hood, and it was great, and it was a big success for us. And after that story, which was fairly extreme in its own right, I figured we were done with glacier caves. <laughs> but the cavers that we had met previously on that story, they gave us a call in the springtime saying, a guide for Mount St. Helens had seen a hole in the ice beneath the rim. It might be an entrance to a new series of glacier caves. This is Mount St. Helens. It's a national treasure. And here we're getting a call saying, would you like to go to some place that nobody has ever been? Ever. How can you say no? We're a local, but we're a scrappy local outfit. We still want to get that story before anyone else. The crater of Mount St. Helens is off limits to the public, completely. And here the helicopter is going up over that rim, right over the crest, and this landscape just opens up in front of us. And it's like something out of Lord of the Rings. Not welcoming at all. And the lava dome in the center of this crater is surrounded by this glacier. And on that glacier was this dark black hole into nowhere. <laughs> Our next three days are about getting inside that thing. So for this story, this is pretty typical of a field guide story where it's just two of us, with myself and our photographer, Todd Sonfleet. We got there about an hour before the rest of the caving party showed up. And I remember thinking, wow, like nobody gets to go here. Like what a privilege. But on the other hand, there's a reason they don't let people in there. It's a crater of an active volcano and it looks like it. It's dark, it's brooding, it's steaming and the hazards are kind of making themselves known all around you. Rock slides peeling off the walls and making this thunderous roar. This ice with these deep crevasses. And then where we were camped was just this black, rocky lava dome where just barely enough flat space to put a tent and steam coming up all around us. Everything about the inside of that crater says, you shouldn't be here. So welcome to Camp Rembrandt on Mount St. Helens. Most of what you see is steam. Yesterday we did identify one for sure sulfur vent. The team of cavers is explaining to us, we have gas monitors, we have oxygen, we got all this equipment for all the thousands of things that can go wrong. See that? Okay. Yeah. No one's ever been in these before. They haven't been mapped before, so we're basically going where no one ever has, and because of that, we have to carry a lot of extra gear. So it's taking a lot of time and gear to get it all up there so we can do this safely. So, you know, we're hiking up there totally not knowing what to expect. The snow is good, but we're framed by the steaming dome on one side and this cascading, crumbling wall on the other. You know, you kind of make haste. <laughs> you go fast. 
got there standing on the edge of this pit. It's 130 feet or so, just descends down into the snow, sloped off at this weird angle. The first caving expedition goes We're in. The side of this thing. Oh, it's overhung, all right. All right, I'm going. Explores these caves. It's beautiful. It's massive. It's safe. Well, as safe as ice glacier caves can get. <laughs> Being here, yeah, it just it, it fills you with life force. Yeah, it just makes you feel alive and happy to be alive. <laughs> and they came out and they're like, you gotta go in. You have to see this. Which the producer of me is saying, well, if I'm gonna write about it, I gotta see it. <laughs> and yo, I'm about to do the Godzilla hole. Exhilarating. About as exhilarating as it gets. And you're looking up in this grand room with this huge skylight, and you're like, wow. <laughs> I just descended into the center of the earth. Then there's this massive oh. channel going under the ice, all lit up with blues and wild light. In two days, we got our story. Explored two different cave systems, documenting the caving expedition. They mapped the caves. They're quite substantial. They're beautiful. And so is true discovery. Go ahead and pull this out. Two days in, I'm like, we can pretty much wrap this thing. And sure enough, the weather starts rolling in. Those clouds that were just kind of quietly billowing down the valley just started pushing up into the crater. And when they did, it got nasty real fast. The caving was done at that point. There's no going up in that glacier. The shooting was basically done because everything was just miserable and wet. At that point, we're all just waiting for the helicopter. And we were on the radio with him constantly. He thinks there's a window between storms. I think I can make it in four hours. It looks like the weather might open then. Four hours later, nothing. It just got progressively worse and worse and worse. And everything that the weather report said it would be would be exactly the opposite. Between a quarter and half an inch are possible. We started getting very cold and extremely wet. And we had some people sleeping outside, like bivvied out in the rocks. Raining. There's no building a fire. There's no way to get warm. You make tea, and that's about it. It's about a 10 on a scale of 10. It's Misery getting scale. pretty brutal right now. For a while, it was just raining. But now, the wind's picked up. Probably blown close to 20. Yeah, they promise us it'll clear for tomorrow. Well, that night turned out to be hell night. I just uh, came back from being outside. It's uh, about 3 a.m. at the moment. That big cabin tent it, it had blown apart and all of their stuff blowing all over the glacier practically. It was truly frightening. Not only did you have this bad storm, but now we understood clearly the helicopter really probably wasn't going to come. If the helicopter's not going to come, how are we getting out of this place? There's three layers of clouds. You don't need the whole meteorology report. He can't do it. Is it going to happen today? There's another front off the coast that's coming. It's going to actually make things worse later this afternoon. Uh, obviously, now we all have to walk out. Everyone's already wet and cold, and, you know, it, it sucks. But as soon as we start moving, you're going to warm up, and we just need to keep moving. That's why I want packs light. Only take, you know, food, water, things you can't... It was just this heavy weight, like, oh, my. There's a hike out of this crater, and there's no trails. And it's across a glacier, and it's storming. Everything we do is about making television. And here we are, piling all our television gear, the discs that we had shot, everything we had worked for, I put out on that ice. Weather changes things. It nixed our helicopter, and I had to abandon our stuff. Half our party got blown off the mountain inside their tent, down a crevasse, but it was good. Still a successful mission, but we'll ask me again when we get to the cars. 
you know, it was so touch and go on the way out. An ice axe in one hand, a pole in the other hand, you know, where, that even though I had a GoPro camera in my pocket ready to shoot the expedition out, I never wanted to take my hands off those two things to reach in and, and get shots, and neither did Todd. One or two shots, that's all we got. Let's plan on six hours. I think we can do it in six. We had the right people there, which we needed. In the end, those skills were needed to help get everyone off the mountain. Three days later, helicopter pilot got a window, and he flew up there, grabbed all our stuff. When I saw that box of discs, and they were intact, and they didn't have water in them or condensation, I just kissed that box. I said, here it is. <laughs> This is as bad as things I've ever gotten on a field guide shoot for me. And I'm sure Todd would say the same thing. Even so, it was worth it. Well, as if a trip to the Oregon coast isn't beautiful enough, one South Coast resident is bringing an ancient and very visual tradition right to the beach, at least temporarily. Field Guide's Joel Gilfillan has the story. The Oregon coast is just a world of its own. Sometimes the tide is low and the waves are soft and it's just nice and quiet and peaceful. Then you come back later on, the same day even, and the tides come in, the waves have gone up, the wind's kicked up, the rocks look like they're just protruding up out of the ocean. It's just a marvelous place to be. I'm Denny Dyke, and I draw on the beaches in Oregon. And I consider Bandon my home beach. Man's always been enthralled with circles and spirals. It's something in our nature, and I think that's what really drew me to it. I started drawing the classical labyrinth, uh, the Cretan, because it's the simplest. The Cretan labyrinth goes back to at least 2000 BC. It's found on all seven continents. And then I went into the Baltic wheel, which is just a variation of it. Uh, the Cathedral Labyrinths, as they're called, came about in about 1200 AD. There's a lot of different variations out there, so I drew one that had seven spirals in it, and when I connected them all, the very last path I took around the entire field, and that's where I came up with Dream Field. People come up and they use the word amazing all the time, but it's not a maze. A maze has dead ends, wrong turns and you struggle to reach the goal. The point of the labyrinth is to enjoy the journey. All you have to do is follow the path and you will get there. <laughs> the reactions of people walking one of my labyrinths never ceases to amaze me. The children, they don't question, they just enjoy. Uh, I've had kids take off on the labyrinth in a full run, uh, but sometimes after they'll see that the older people are walking slower, they'll go back and walk. Some adults are very tentative. They'll start off real hesitant. By the time they get halfway through, they've relaxed, they've settled in, and they've just lightened their load. When you're inside the labyrinth, the rest of the world goes away. The peacefulness, the quietness, the lack of distraction. And hopefully after you're done walking, you can take it back out in the world and walk in a little more peace. Everybody thinks sand is sand. Uh, that's not true. It's harder at different times of the year. It's different in the morning than in the evening. You can tell by walking on it. And so one of the first things I do is I'll walk the whole section that I want to draw in, 
see where it's damp and where it's dry, feel how hard it is, where it softens up. And then I just kind of go to the center and uh, when I'm ready, It takes me about 45 minutes to an hour to draw one. If there's anything on the beach when I get there, I work around it and I incorporate it. The more rocks, the better. The sound of the ocean's there all the time for me. The sound of my staff running through the sand. Oh, what a sound. It's amazing how loud it can get. After the first line is drawn, everything else just kind of goes on autopilot. And every now and then something goes wrong. So I just gotta take a deep breath. Uh, let's see. You correct it on the fly. Okay, let's take this one to this one. And carry on. That's it. Labyrinth done except for the grooming. I have labyrinth groomers that actually come down, volunteers. You want to help too? OK. Let's grab a couple rakes. I draw it out with my staff, but I have my groomers go over my staff mark with the rakes. See how it's roughed up now? Mm -hmm. OK. And then you just continue through here? Beautiful. We got us another labyrinth groomer. So it's a combined art form. It's them and me. <laughs> Why do I do it? Um, first of all, I do it for me. Uh, the sensation I get in that hour or two that I'm drawing, you can't replace it with anything. To see a blank piece of sand, take my staff to it, and leave my mark. And then it becomes more than that as people come you want to walk my labyrinth? One path. No dead ends, no wrong turns. Wow, did we do it? Yeah, let's, let's do, do it. it. Absolutely. Thanks a lot. I guess my main hope for anybody that walks one of my sand labyrinths is to have me enjoy the experience. Forget about their other obligations, their other concerns. The rhythm, the movement, that peacefulness has an effect on the physical body. Anytime you can go inward and lose that other distraction, you're helping your mental health. The ocean will reclaim it, uh, and I have no problem with that. Sometimes it comes up gently and just kind of dissolves the sand and the grooming away. Other times it comes up and takes a whole big bite out of it. But you want to see it. You want to see the ocean come in and reclaim its own. It's one thing to be on the Oregon coast, but to combine that with the sacredness and the spirituality of a labyrinth, I think that's what I'm after. If you're on the south coast and want to know where Denny's going to be drawing next, you can check out our website for a link. And that's it for another edition of Oregon Field Guide. If you have any questions or comments or you want to watch any of our stories again, please visit our website at opb.org slash fieldguide. And for more behind the scenes look, check us out on Facebook. And until next week, thanks for joining us. We'll see you then. Major support for Oregon Field Guide is provided by Dorothy D. Gage. Additional support provided by Coit Family Foundation, Fred and Clara Dolan Charitable Foundation, Kay Kitagawa and Andy Johnson Laird, Christine and David Vernier, and the following. And viewers like you. Thank you.